Bonjour et bien. Uh, welcome to our last uh, session um, going beyond uh, the beaten path to more circular solutions. Uh, within planning this session, we wanted to find examples of rural communities and or remote communities who would use the concept of circularity in transforming waste uh, into uh, sources of wealth, creating uh, circular solutions to linear problems. We uh, found 30 examples of creativity, innovation, dynamic, ingenious uh, examples. It was so difficult to choose only five. Uh, in this session, you'll be hearing stories from Indonesia, Uruguay, Burkina Faso, Canada, and uh, the Esor Islands. But first of all, let's start to by better understanding the issues that we are uh, encountering here in Canada in the northern communities with uh, remote um, communities who live unique situations. We inv invited the vice president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada, Lisa Kopakwaluk. All Inuit from Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Chukotka. Chukotka. My, uh, my bad, on matters of international importance, donc. Uh, to uh, Ms. Khopak. Thank you. Good afternoon. So yes, my name is Lisa Khopakwaluk, and I'm the Vice President of, of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Canada. Now, ICC represents over 100,000, 180,000 Inuit who use and occupy an Arctic region, as mentioned, uh, in Chukotka, Russia, through Alaska, Inuit Nunanat in Canada, and stretching to Greenland. Our Inuit homeland, as we call it, Inuit Nunat, is larger than the European Union. One people living in four countries. I'm pleased to be with you today to speak to a circular economy in the Arctic. Now, there's much to say about these important issues you are looking at today. And in the time I have, I will introduce you to a small part of my culture and one challenge we face in applying circular economic practices in the Arctic. We've had uh, practiced a highly circular economy long before the phrase was coined, with little going to waste. And the kayak, which I will pronounce kayak, is just one example of this, as you know. And just as it was and remains an important means of transport for purposes ranging from hunting and socializing with other communities, it makes incredible use of local materials of all types of origin um, and to make something so useful where there might otherwise be waste. The waterproof shell, as you may know, was traditionally made of seal or caribou skin. The weight bearing structure is made of driftwood or wood from a more southern region that they obtained through trade. And so um, once the, 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 and the construction was also a means of transmitting knowledge. And um, once it was finished, then it would come back. Uh, all, all that had been spent on it uh, would come back to the elements and or recycled in, in another way. Uh, so I speak to it as an example of how Inuit have and are continuing to build the principles of circular economy and that this, this type of knowledge is still continuing to be part of our values today, even though we live in the most remote parts of the planet. In this uh, day and age, however, um, the Arctic has been in for the last 100 years um, our circular economies, our traditional circular economies have been replaced by southern disposable, high energy, carbon intensive, high cost supply chains. 
And so we have, uh, you know, uh, for example, a short shipping Z season, uh, but we uh, depend a lot on imported goods. Therefore, whereas the Hayak served many purposes, we are now dependent on an Arctic shipping fleet, which is in a sense now critical infrastructure for our communities. They come in every year from Southern areas. So as a result of this wage economy and Southern supply chain, there has been an accumulation of waste in our communities because while creation of waste is not unique to the Arctic and is like other Canadian communities, there are few means of transporting the waste to places where they can be managed and processed appropriately. And so the Arctic's lack of permanent waste depots in communities is a major challenge for our communities. So what are some actions that we can employ? What can we, what type of actions can we take to enhance, to achieve and return to circularity in the circumpolar Arctic? Good waste separation at waste transfer stations and depots to create the opportunity for future recycling when transportation becomes available. So better agreements around shipping back waste and recyclables on the same ships that lift goods into the communities. Very often what we find is many of these materials go to our communities full in, in full ships, but then the ships come back to the south empty. There's also the development of greenhouses in some communities now around Inuit Nunangat, where green waste can be put to better use now and to grow vegetables. So exploring more e-waste collection strategies to Im improve diversion. And that's just one example of many challenges that we are facing in the Arctic and ones that we are making efforts to find sustainable solutions for. I would like to uh, thank you for having invited me to, to participate in, in this uh, very interesting conference. And I'm looking forward to hearing the different viewpoints and the issues surrounding circular economy. I would invite the input of those of you who have listened in what you may share as to how we may make the economy of the Arctic region and other remote and rural areas more circular. Thank you. Nakormik, Lisa. Nakormik, Lisa. Thank you so much. It was really a huge pleasure to listen to you. And I hear uh, several themes here that uh, we've already heard over the day and a half that we've had together. Um, Minister Regan in the United States spoke, spoke of experimentation, what Nate Nobed uh, from Arika uh, said, how important it is to recognize that uh, circular systems have always existed in the Inuit uh, uh, communities and elsewhere. So you have the importance here um, for Western uh, powers to transform these current systems uh, that have become uh, crucial into uh, circular systems again. Thank you once again, uh, Lisa Kopakwaluk into English, do a quick language change, um, because I'll be introducing my co-host soon. So when we think of circular solutions at the local level, we often think about things that only really work in places with lots of people, extensive infrastructure, and a strong internet connection. But of course, that's only true of cities, particularly uh, bigger cities like Amsterdam and Toronto. And this is not necessarily true for a good portion of people around the world. So I would like to introduce um, Oriana uh, Romano. Um, hello, Oriana. It is a pleasure to have you join us. So Oriana, you are the head of the unit dedicated to circular economy, urban policies, and sustainable development for, and I'm going to 
It's going to take me a hot second to say this because it is a very long title. The OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, Small and Medium Enterprises, Regions and Cities. Did the audience catch that? <laughs> the yes. four pieces to this. <laughs> Amazing. So I'm going to turn to you now and I'm going to ask what are some circular solutions that are often proposed for cities that may not work in a rural and or remote community? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm going to use these uh, few minutes to, to respond to your very interesting questions. So we know, as you said, that 70% of the population will be living in, in cities. And so this means that they will ask for uh, more products and services. But we also know that 30% of the population is living in a rural and less dense areas, which, by the way, are uh, also very fast growing. Uh, cities are increasingly taking uh, initiatives in uh, relation to the transition towards a circular economy. And this consists, for example, in uh, um, sharing, repurposing, redistributing, moving from ownership to services uh, or to renting. And it's true that for some of these uh, actions, uh, it is uh, requires certain population density that will use these services. However, it has to be highlighted at least three things. The first is that uh, urban and rural areas are not isolated ecosystem, and so they need to work together to close loops for example, in terms of food value chain, cities are major consumers, but food is produced elsewhere. The second is that circular economy implies a systemic approach. So both in urban and rural areas, it is needed to move beyond the traditional misconception of the circular economy, equal waste management and increase the resource efficiency and material efficiency. For example, products for mining can be reused for construction material and, uh, and many other purposes. And then the third point is that the circular economy is a shared responsibility, so, so everybody play a role. Agro, food sector, forestry, plastic, chemi se chemical sector are all related as a, um, output for somebody and an input for somebody else. That is so interesting. It's interesting to see sort of the synergies between what you said and what uh, Lisa uh, uh, Kual looks said as well, because you mentioned how in rural settings, it may not be the most efficient thing to look at the end result, right? We often have in city and in urban landscapes, we have a, when we talk about the circular economy, we have a habit of looking at the end result. We have a habit of looking at waste and how do we fix waste. And what I'm hearing you say is we need to also be looking at the supply chain. We need to be looking at the beginning um, natural resources and see how we can maximize those in rural areas since the recycling measures and the reuse measures at the end may not be as feasible. And it's really interesting because um, Lisa gave the example of the kayak and how the kayak, each of the pieces of the kayak had multiple uses beyond simply just the kayak piece. So with that, I'm going to ask you and the audience the same question. And so we're going to hear you orally, but I'm going to ask that the audience drop their answer into the ideas tab um, on the website. Um, but essentially, what are some advantages that rural and or remote communities have over cities when it comes to adapting, um, adopting circularity, right? We're always talking about the difficulties, but what are some of the advantages? Absolutely. Uh, so we have to take into account at least uh, two important uh, things. The first one is uh, um, regarding the natural asset. Uh, of course, rural areas uh, hold a high proportion of natural assets and agricultural land, which, by the way, make some of the economic activities, of course, dependent on these natural resources. And they have all the interest to use the resources efficiently and to make sure that uh, last longer in time, they don't waste energy and water that would be needed, for example, to, to produce food or to uh, make sure that uh, these activities can take place. But there is also a social component that we have to take 
take into account uh, as enabling factors in rural and uh, uh, remote community. There might be an increased sense of community, attachment to a place, trust between people, uh, easier way to do also networking uh, across uh, social, economic and environmental actors. And all this uh, collaboration is uh, fundamental to make, uh, to, to set in place uh, what uh, the circular economy is basically is, as uh, I was uh, mentioning before, an holistic and systemic approach. And this has been also highlighted in uh, our uh, OECD work. You know, the OECD is um, an intergovernmental organization. So we work with countries and of course we look at within countries at urban rural areas. So we work at regional level. And importantly, uh, the OECD principles on rural policy recognize the role of the circular economy as a means to strengthen social, economic, ecological and cultural resilience of rural community. And also in view of uh, the COP26, uh, the OECD Rural Agenda for Action lists the circular economy in combination with the bioeconomy as an essential contribution to advance rural uh, regions uh, uh, to contribute to the climate change goals. And of course, while uh, holding important potential for rural development, uh, but again, what I would like to highlight is uh, the importance of these uh, linkages across uh, urban and rural areas, the fact that um, this collaboration and these synergies should uh, make sure that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, exchanging materials, uh, looking at uh, upstream activities, so um, not only the downstream when uh, the waste is already produced and can be transformed to something else, but it's really how to make sure that we prevent uh, waste production, we use resources as much as possible, uh, we maximize the efficiency of natural resources is also not to waste absolutely any available resource on the earth. Grazie, Oriana. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> we will be checking back in with you at the end of the session to get some of your takeaways. So stay in the background, listen in, and I'm excited to hear more from you. I'm going to be creeping as well the, um, the uh, comments and ideas in the ideas tab pretty soon. So keep, the, uh, keep at it if you're still sort of writing an idea or a thought. And we will now sort of uh, transition into some of our case studies. So récemment, moi j'ai eu le... Recently, I had the pleasure to meet five extraordinary people uh, throughout the world, and I asked them to share their ideas on how rural and remote communities can implement circular uh, circularity to the, uh, their interest, in their interest. First of all, here's some um, conversations I had with uh, people in Burkina Faso and Uruguay. Bonjour, Sylvie. Je suis... Hi, Sylvie. I'm uh, really happy to meet you. Let's speak to us about you, who you are, where you live, what you do, and what you're doing for uh, the circular economy. Thank you, Chuck, for this uh, opportunity. My name is Sylvie uh, Yamago. I'm in uh, Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou, more specifically, and I work in a program, the uh, National Program for Di Biodigesters of Burkina Faso. And I'm charged, I'm in charge of the program. We accompany rural populations in adopting uh, the technology of biodigestion. It's a, a system that allows them to access a clean um, resource uh, to cook and uh, to, for lighting also. And it also gives them uh, organic uh, compost to improve their, um, their um, agricultural needs. It's in partnership with the uh, government, and we're trying to set up an economic uh, activity, also trade, that will um, allow a, a play between supply and demand so that we can, in the long term, market these technologies in Burkina Faso. 
Today, uh, about 15,000 people have access to this technology throughout the country. And um, they participate in a circular economic economy by reusing the waste from their agricultural uh, activities. And they uh, use this for their uh, economic benefit. Oh, this is wonderful. And uh, as a side note, uh, Wagadougou is my favorite city. I love the place. Wonderful. Now I have another question. What advice would you have for other communities who would like to undertake similar programs, even in other countries who would like to support their populations in developing a circular economy? What would be the first stages, the first steps to take? What do you, uh, what would you advise us? Thank you. If other countries would like to follow Burkina Faso's example, I would say, first of all, they should um, have a different approach than what we have today to the question of waste. And once they have changed their approach to waste, they can uh, move on to a circular economy uh, strategy by setting up at a local level the conditions needed to uh, reuse uh, this wealth. I mean, by their creating, by that creating a green uh, jobs, creating a sustainable economy around the use of waste. And for that, at a more central uh, level, there needs to be a strong political will in support of this transformation. After all, it does require uh, the uh, it, a lot of um, information, um, awareness uh, for these people to change their paradigms. And um, local communities need to have access to these technologies, as is the case um, in our country with the biodigester. It's something that it has a certain cost, so we need financial resources uh, in support of the communities. Finally, I would say the communities locally need to, how would I say it, be able to bring technology but also finance to the table in support of this transfer. This is what I would have to say to that question. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for uh, sharing space with us. It was a pleasure. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Good morning, Maria. It's uh, a pleasure to have you with us the, today. Could you speak to us about yourself, who you are, where you work, what you do? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be there. I'm uh, Maria Gonzalez. I uh, come from Uruguay, which is a small country, three million uh, inhabitants between Argentina and Br Brazil in uh, southern Latin America. We uh, are a food exporter. Our uh, economy is a service economy also. Before we go on, uh, let's say that uh, we do, uh, we have invested in uh, renewable uh, energies and we're talking about uh, circular economies, but we've um, undertaken a certain transformation already. And I work with this uh, project called Bioba Valor, a uh, project which uh, promotes a uh, circular economy uh, through the use of technology, um, and uh, the reuse of um, uh, waste diversion. So we have uh, international support also, and uh, we uh, have tried to promote these technologies in various uh, sectors. Wow, unbelievable. And I find that very inspiring because uh, Uruguay is a country that's quite similar to Canada, in fact. So I can see synergies happening there, potentially. According to you, 
What should be the first steps to follow if a community or a country um, wants to uh, reuse um, our waste uh, in order for our waste to be able to uh, reuse for the benefit of our economy and uh, of the planet? Well, there's maybe three lessons that uh, we've drawn from the project. The first is to collaborate with different sectors and different ministries. Also, in the public sector, it's important to have a coordination between the energy ministry, the cultural, um, the environment uh, ministry, and to have common um, agendas defined a space where sustainable production is possible because uh, the different ministries um, have the same uh, principles, the same values. That was a challenge at the beginning, but um, it's something that we uh, managed to, to uh, get to. And so uh, circular economy should not simply be seen as something that is uh, an economic uh, or an environmental uh, challenge. It's also important to work with the uh, public, the private sector, the academics, uh, universities, etc. So we had meetings with uh, all the sectors. They all have their own issues, um, their own challenges, and so the technologies that will offer solutions will be different. And so there's a need also for public policies to develop, to help them develop solutions. Um, we need to be specific. So we need to uh, speak to the different sectors and understand their realities, their challenges. That's highly important. So that's one point. But then through the project, we also had uh, a, an initiative to, to, with uh, the ministries to help the uh, private sector. But also we need to um, be able to identify opportunities. That's very important. And that's something we did with um, the National Academy also. It was very important to be able to have this information uh, at a local level. Uh, we uh, worked with professors so that they could teach with the circular economy mindset in the various universities and faculties they work at. The third uh, very important point for us was to be able to develop uh, pilot projects. Um, concrete projects with um, partners, co-funding, co um, and we needed to be able to see what the experience of farmers was. It was very important to speak uh, to people on the ground, to see, to learn from them. It helped us also from the public policy point of view to really understand uh, the realities, to be able to develop the proper tools, therefore. OK, wonderful. And thank you for sharing all that with us. Uh, very inspiring indeed. And um, I hear how important it is to really listen to the people, to their needs. Um, to their uh, concerns in order to be able to, to respond with public policies that really do support people on in the field. Thank you, Norma, for your time and for all your knowledge. And um, I wish, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you for chatting with me. Great. So, so much for the first uh, two uh, case studies. I loved uh, chatting with these two women because they really underlined how else, how much um, uh, waste reclamation could be important for uh, communities in uh, Burkina Faso. It's important how we reframe um, the concept of waste and waste reclamation. Um, we can transform that into a wealth. And then uh, from Uruguay, we heard the idea uh, how, of how important it is to listen to the community, their needs, and to collaborate with them to help them realize their ambitions. It's the same as we uh, heard yesterday with Dakota and Erin. So there's a lot of synergy throughout the forum. We're talking about all these different themes, and uh, yet we come back to the same learnings. To look at some of your ideas um, about some of the advantages that rural and remote communities have, and all of the ones that popped up on the, on the 
on the ideas piece is that rural communities are often more used to fixing things because they have less access uh, to getting things brand new uh, the same way we do in a city. And so there's already sort of that skill set in place and that mentality in place. And there's many other comments that really sort of highlight how uh, rural communities have closer social ties and social bonds um, amongst each other and with the environment than what we, what we tend to stereotypically see in urban settings. So that is really interesting. So next, we are headed to the Azores, Indonesia, and we're also somewhat staying in Canada, but going to the opposite end of the country, to La Colombie Britannique, to British Columbia, to explore how communities are turning their linear problems into circular solutions. So while these videos are playing, I do ask that you take a moment to participate in a world, in a, ooh, in a word cloud question. I just want to point out to all the viewers, English is a hard language, to a word cloud question that will pop up on your screen. Um, so first up, we're going to be starting the video uh, from Francisco de, uh, de Sousa Fernandez, who is the director of the Regional Civil Engineering Laboratory in the beautiful autonomous archipelago of the Azores. Alezi. Hello, bonjour, Francisco. It is a pleasure to meet you. Please talk to us about uh, Rebuild 17, um, this phenomenal initiative that you are a part of. And tell us also about your geographic location, the Azores. What is that? Where is that? Hello, Shaq. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Azores is a wonderful place uh, to work and to, to visit in the middle of Atlantic between Europe and America. Um, it, uh, it's an archipelago, an autonomous region from Portugal, uh, and it has uh, nine islands, the, the smallest one uh, with the 300 and the, uh, inhabitants and the biggest one with 130,000 inhabitants. Um, so it's uh, wonderful. Uh, Rebuild 17 project, what it is? It's a project uh, uh, funded for the financial mechanism for e-grants that is from uh, Liechtenstein, Norway and Iceland, Iceland funding. It's promoted by uh, the Azores government uh, the, uh, through the Regional Civil Engineer Laboratory also. Uh, and as its partners, uh, Fibronomics Azores, and um, um, a company for, from Iceland that is an um, engineering uh, consulting uh, company. Um, this project aims to, to promote the circular economy in the construction area and focus on the creation of and development of a platform that connects the entities involved in the sector to add some value to construction and demolition waste. We, uh, in this project, we started to uh, study the characterization of this waste and we have developed, developed some uh, demonstration models also. And we'd like also to have a call for ideas in this area with uh, where everyone from all over the world can uh, participate in uh, with new ideas for products uh, with uh, the incorporation of waste materials from construction. Uh, also, uh, and the main goal of this Rebuild 17 project is to, to make this platform that uh, will connect all the stakeholders in this area, uh, the, the public and the private ones, and also the, all the individuals, all, all of us, uh, so, okay, so it can help to the, the ones who produce wastes that uh, all of us produce in our houses and the, the, the companies that are civil construction companies to know uh, where is the best way to, to deliver these wastes or uh, the, 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 the best ways to, to have a key, um, to have a um, um, a scale-up value in in um, in the in the transformation of this waste, also uh, uh, in 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 the new products in this area, and the companies who who, who receive these these wastes and to and to have technology to to make these products, 
we'll have in this platform uh, the knowledge to know uh, all all the, the entities that uh, that are in this area uh, all the quantities that uh, will be are planned to to be produced of these wastes so uh, they also can have uh, some development and some production in in this area we'd like to aim here uh, um, a, a, a platform a case study that uh, functions here in azores and then can, can be replied to another regions in the in the in the in the, in the country or even in another countries but uh, uh, thinking always in 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 a, a local matter because we think these these platforms works and function uh, with um, a confined and, and not too big uh, community so it can um, uh, transform this linear process to a circle process uh, with not many uh, waste uh, and uh, and um, the instance in the in the in the transportation of, of these materials that is phenomenal that is truly a pleasure to listen to and i think that teaches all of us who are listening a lesson in the importance of of scaling and the importance of recognizing that certain things function better in local smaller um in local smaller pieces that then allow us to expand larger thank you so much for sharing space with us today thank you for being here and i wish you a good rest of the day thank you Sheikh. thank you all Danica, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, it is a pleasure to meet you. Please tell us about yourself, tell us where you're located, and tell us about the phenomenal initiative that you're leading. Sure, Jack, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Danica, and I'm based here in Jakarta, in Indonesia. And I'm the founder of Sukachita, a social enterprise that connects women in villages all over Indonesia with access to education through our craft schools and living wages. And we're here because I feel like there is a need to bridge the disconnect between us globally and the impacts behind our clothes. Because the reality is that something that we don't think about when we wear clothes is that only 2% of women who actually made them can earn enough to support her families. But also environmentally, all the chemicals that are currently used to dye and process it are causing 20% of the world's water pollution, hurting not only the communities who live around the rivers, but also you and me, Chuck, because we basically, our food comes from the same water that is polluted. So that's why I decided to create Sukachita and working directly with women in villages, not factories. And it's like really uh, everything that we make is what we call made right and that's our transparency standard that ensures that first of all everything we make provides a living wage to women in villages not factories and secondly everything is dyed with plants that we grow regeneratively to grow to heal the soil and the point is also like to really make sure that through something as simple as what we wear every day we can actually change lives Wow, that sounds so phenomenal. That's that's an incredibly important thing that you guys are doing, and that touches me um, profoundly. And you mentioned these phenomenal women that you are working with. So can you tell me more about how maybe the indigenous culture of these women has influenced your, um, your circular economy um, business model? Sure, and that's a very interesting question because I always, I was born and I grew up in an urban setting. So for me, so Kachita was my first point of contact with more indigenous cultures, actually. And it was very interesting because as an economist myself, I was often trained in the idea of progress. You know, as a business, we're supposed to have efficiency, profit maximization, and all that. But everything changed ever since I worked with Sukachita. And one thing that became really clear is that indigenous cultures, for me, is really the key to have sustainable development. The thing is, the women we work with, they live coexisting and they live in their interdependently with nature. And nature is circular by design. 
when done right, nothing that we actually use to produce our clothes ever has to leave the loop. The plants we grow to die with, it returns to the soil as compost. We even use the waste of the banana tree that our women use to eat as dyeing material, actually. So we model our business based on this. Using only natural fibers, we can use the scraps into smaller products and even the smallest offcuts we turn into our tags. We also offer free repair services so that our clothes are worn for years, not wears. That is incredible. And I love what you said earlier that we're cre you're creating a business model and a, a company where essentially just by changing the clothes that you wear, you can change the world and support the world. That's, that's phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Hello, Bonjour, Jacqueline. It is a pleasure. Hello. Hey, thank you for being here. So please tell us about you, where are you located? What's the phenomenal initiative that you're leading? And um, give us the lowdown. Hi, Jack. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Van Tonder. I'm the director for Metal Tech Alley. We are a marketing strategy for the Lower Columbia Initiatives Corporation, and we are in trail in British Columbia. Uh, it's seven communities that came together to start this initiative. And our location is very important. We're right by the US border. I can almost see it from my office window. Uh, we are fortunate to have Tech Metals Trail operations in our community. It's one of the world's largest fully integrated zinc and lead smelting and refining complexes. We also have two recycling facilities, KC Recycling and Retrieve Technologies. So that's who we are. Amazing. And tell us about um, how your community creates a circular economy through the work that you guys do. We are in this unique position that we have, um, uh, we start with a linear economy, which is take metals. Um, they make different kinds of metals. Um, the best example that I can use is lead. So they make the lead here at um, tech trial operations. Uh, lead is the most recycled product in the world and 99% of a car battery gets recycled. So why I'm using lead and um, car battery, so the lead that comes from here goes into a car battery. Um, after the lifespan of the car battery, let's say six to eight years, the car battery comes back here to um, KC Recycling. They recycle the car battery, take out the lead and the asset. That goes back to tech, goes back into the system, and they make another battery of that the car battery of that lead, and then it comes back again in six to eight years. So what starts as a, as a linear economy then changes into a circular economy. We also recycle the plastic casings of the car batteries here and they become another casing for a car battery and comes back here for recycling in six to eight years at the end of the lifespan of the battery. We also recycle at Retrieve Technologies, uh, we re recycle lithium ion batteries. Um, the new EV batteries that you get in all the electric vehicles also gets recycled here, um, right here in trail. So that's what we do. That is incredible. And what advice do you have for other small towns or other small communities who want to follow in trails phenomenal footsteps? Um, we started by uh, looking at what we are what are unique to our area and what we can use as sustainability for a rural community. We looked at our strengths and our weaknesses. Um, 
very big success story here is our public private partnership that we have because you're a small community and it's very important that you have the public and the private um, companies working together on this um, being in a smaller community it's just easier to do business than being in a bigger community you will uh, go to the ski hill in the morning and suddenly you're sitting on the ski lift with the general manager of tech and then you start talking business and and the business relationship starts. And that's how it really works. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for being with us today. It has been a pleasure to be in this space with you. Thank you very much for having me, Chuck. Very nice meeting you. Thank you, virtual me, for doing those interviews. <laughs> um, anyway, no, that was it. Was so interesting listening to all of these, all of these case studies, and all of these people in different parts of the world creating circularity in such unique and interesting ways, while really highlighting the strengths of the communities that they're in. Where we have in Trail BC that public-private partnership, because you're going to be on the ski trails with the CEO of whichever company and your mayor at the same time. Where we looking at um, Indonesia and how um, Denise has such um, such easy access to the indigenous cultures of the land and really sort of takes that in inspiration for that business model or in the Azores how they really maximize what it means to be an archipelago of islands so Arena, we only have a few minutes left please give us your top two takeaways Thank you, Chuck. First, I would like to congratulate these initiatives. Uh, they were so inspiring. Uh, well, my two main takeaways are the following. What I heard is that technology is part of a response, but the other part is governance. Uh, the what we heard about uh, the biodigester technology in Burkina Faso, BioValor in Argentina, or the project, the demonstration project in Azores, they all highlighted the importance of governance, the importance of coordinating across the ministries, uh, creating partnerships with governments, uh, making sure that the financial resources are available making sure that the stakeholders are engaged, the regulations is in place. So this is all part of the system that needs to enable these technologies to actually work. This is the first to take away. And the second, from what we heard, is that um, is start up and scale up. We heard about a demonstration project. We heard about pilot projects in BioValor and the trial in British Columbia, for example. This is a, a good way to demonstrate that changes are possible, that moving from a linear to a circular economy in both urban and rural areas is actually possible. What is important then is to learn from this experience and making sure that these do not just represent a pilot demonstration, but they will become business as usual. And in order to do so, our colleagues already gave us the recipe. It is needed to produce data, to share information, to build consensus across the community, to engage the, the private and the public sector, to share the best practices and the success stories, but perhaps also to share the failures. It didn't work because we didn't have the right conditions in place. So let's share these conditions and let's make sure that actually these uh, initiatives that can really become the normal in the future. Oh, those are some good takeaways. So really sort of we have the takeaway of governance and we have the takeaway of hope essentially. The fact that things can happen, the, the power of being able to start small and scale big. And then looking at the word cloud, the word that stood out the most by dramatic sense, because it is much larger than every other word, and the way word clouds work for anyone who may not know, is that as people sort of add in words, they, they merge and they grow. And so the largest word we have is collaboration, mm -hmm. that idea of collaboration. And that's something that we saw in every single case study, is no one did it on their own. No one stood up and was like, this is something I'm doing solo with no help whatsoever. 
it, it, they all demonstrated partnership, partnership with local peoples, partnership with government, partnership with private sector, pri partnership with the entire community. And that sort of goes back to what a lot of people have been saying and what we heard from Lisa and what you said earlier as well, that smaller communities know each other. They have stronger social bonds. And so they're able to leverage on those social bonds to build these powerful partnerships that are necessary to happen in order for circularity to even take place. Um, before we close off this panel, this webinar, um, or not this webinar, sorry, this session of this webinar, please stay, stay tuned, people. We're not done yet. <laughs> this session of this, um, of this forum. All right, now, do you have any final closing words for us? Well, just at this, uh, this conversation resonates very much with the work that we are carrying out at the OECD, supporting cities, regions, and national government with promoting, facilitating, and enabling the circular economy. The circular economy is basically doing more with less. It's a systemic approach. I perfectly agree with your conclusions in terms of collaboration and boosting innovation, but this won't be possible in a solo way manner. We need to create these synergies and we have to make sure that this transition is just and is a shared responsibilities across people, policies and places. Grazie, merci, merci beaucoup, Ariana. Thank you very much, Ariana, for being with us. Uh, uh, it's so nice to have somebody here to uh, sum things up. Uh, so uh, with that, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, for everybody who is watching, don't go away because we're going to continue uh, soon. Thanks very much.